The price of Tanster has shot up after the news became public that the mines and the moons of Garinor were nearly played out. A slow disaster. The first major economic fall in centuries. Sajisu dealers and brokers began to hoard the precious mineral. Most modern drive systems relied on the rare natural crystals within it, and inevitably, the financial ripples spread out. Drive maintenance and construction prices increased exponentially, haulage rates too. Commodity prices went up all across the outer worlds. Income did not. Businesses closed. Employment was hard to come by, and bases like food and replacement atmospheric gases became scarce. An interstellar slump. Hard times. The trading rim had it really bad. The reports were hard to watch, like a throwback to a past age. Smuggled footage of starving, desperate, rag-clad Sajitsu miners mobbing sword towers, of hollow-eyed younglings gasping for air as they cut down the oxygen percentage by another point. There were other sources of tankster, of course. It wasn't like the drives were going to stop working or anything, but the quality of ore was lower, and the reserves were difficult to exploit. Prices were going to stay high. Not that the humans were affected, of course they weren't. Their chunky, rugged ships used different tech foundations, inertia fields and howden coils and warp inducers. Ugly and a little slower, maybe, but solid and reliable. Their vessels had always been politely ignored by the other races, who preferred the elegant Sajitsu designs. But now, what with the building difficulties, they were in demand. Human shipyards were inundated, their books overflowing with orders for replacement drive units, and even new ships. And that news coincided with the loss of the Salkaf Ma, the big Jif Metsu Corporation transport that famously vanished out beyond the Metak Nebula, never emerging from Hyper, taking with it half a year's worth of refined minerals and rare earths scratched from the harsh Sajitsu worlds out along the rim. Not the stuffing out of their electronics manufacturers, weapons makers, and all of the other industries that had been relying on her precious cargo. Humans had their own sources, stocks in abundance in the way that humans always do, and the Sajitsu had no choice but to purchase from their neighbor's volatile overpriced markets near bankrupted them. And then, just to put a cherry on top of what was already a bad situation, the old Pastaru son upped and died. The whole Sajisu state went into mourning, shut down for weeks, until eventually a new Pastaru assumed office, wreaked havoc on itineraries and schedules, near caused a second financial collapse on its own. The old boy had always been a pain, hard to deal with and keen on gifts, to make a scheme happen, but he always found compromises and had seen to it that his minions and staff engineered workarounds. He made things happen. The new fellow was a stickler, it seemed, a traditionalist, keen to implement the old values, whatever they were, focused on securing his position and in placing his loyalists in key roles on all the Sajitsu worlds. There was a great deal of disruption, of jockeying and petty politics. It affected a lot of things, caused a lot more problems with commerce as old officials disappeared and new individuals took their places, bringing with them with their old interpretations of old agreements. And just when some compromise had been found, they too were gone, and a new face with a new agenda appeared. The other species quickly found that the humans were just, well, easier. They might have been scheming hagglers who would cheerfully swindle you out of every last credit you possessed if they got half a chance, but you could get past that. If you stuck to your guns, and didn't let them baffle you with their slick words and awe you with their unbeatable deals. At least you knew where you were with humans. Their contracts were honoured, and their products were actually rather good for the price. It was truly a difficult time for the Sajitsu. Their dominance, their economy, the very stability of the polity seemed to be a real risk. But not so for the humans, and not by their own design either. It was something of a boom and it just sort of fell into their laps. They were already an emerging technological and industrial powerhouse within the Alliance, just a step behind the ancient Sajitsu estate, designing and improving and building as they quietly spread to new systems. The downturn in the fortunes of the Sajitsu only served to elevate them further. The Sajitsu genuinely seemed to hold no grudge over it, no anger, no hard feelings. 
though they had every reason to. It was a cycle, they said stoically, a fluctuation. In due time, things would be resolved, and their fortunes would be restored. The attack speeders came in low and fast, really fast, screaming across the stony sea. Low emission plants, heavy drive shielding, nap of earth flight, they almost, almost made it down to the sensor net without detection. Secondary detectors picked them up, luck really. A formation flew right over one of the mobile outposts and frantic alerts were sent. Interceptor squadrons were scrambled, accelerating out of their launch base and soaring into the darkening evening skies. They found them a few hundred clicks out, and a frantic dogfight ensued. The wire sat jitsu craft jinking and weaving, skimming across the terrain at suicidal altitudes, the sleek human fighters twisting and rolling to get clean shots. Defensive fire from the alien craft, blue, white and rapid. Autocannon fire, orange red tracers searing the sky, intense streaks as missiles flew, and flashes and thuds and bangs as craft exploded and shattered across the hard ground. Bright trails crisscrossed the dark heavens. They got through. They were too fast and there were too many. And they launched their payloads. Chunky cruise missiles that sped and wove away. Oldport's defensive batteries opened up and the air was thick with projectiles. Sweeping arcs of fire controlled by sophisticated sensors that locked onto the incoming blips and blew them out of the air. But again, there were just too many. The missiles found their targets, slamming into towers and complexes with huge, ground-shaking explosions. Many of the missiles were following one another, locked onto the same spot, their devastating impacts toppling already weakened structures or further fragmenting piles of rubble. The interceptors didn't let up as the speeders turned and streaked away. They swooped in, lean and menacing, and hungry for vengeance, tearing through the retreating craft. Wreckage littered the boulder-strewn shores, and columns of oily black smoke rose into the night. Those few speeders that escaped did so only because the interceptors had run out of ammo. The Chiron below the news anchor carried the grim toll. Every few minutes it would clear and return with a new higher figure. Hundreds of thousands missing, tens of thousands confirmed dead. The human settlements on Morales were in a mutual state of shock. The feed cut to a shot from a drone hovering over shattered rubble. The remnants of a huge apartment complex, decent quality worker housing. It had been quite nice, with gardens, pools, on-site parking, a mall, a gymnasium even. The Sajisu had levelled it. The drone panned out and rotated, showing devastation as far as its camera could see, and the pall of smoke that hung over the city. Late evening. Lots of people had been home where the attack struck. The feed cut back to the frowning, grim-faced anchor. A graphic appeared beside her, showing Oldport and its surroundings. It marked the impact sites. Dots in red, 80 they believed, hitting all over the city. Then came dots in blue. The fishing port in the marina, untouched. The big military base on Central Point, and the maglev terminals too, all intact. The only damage to the sprawling factories and the warehousing districts were from missiles that had been shot down. The city's spaceport had been overflown during the attack, but was unharmed. All of the strikes had landed in residential districts. The footage switched to rescue crews clawing at rubble, of blooded and dust-caked victims being carried away in impromptu stretches, shocked, blank-faced survivors draped in reflective blankets, and weeping, frantic friends and relatives clutching helplessly at their communicators. The Terran intermediary demanded an audience with the ambassador. The official, a minor bureaucrat at the diplomatic enclave, signalled in the negative. We cannot, it replied flatly. We don't understand why, the intermediary insisted. Humans and Sajisu had always been the best of friends. Why would you do this? Why would you start a war? The official fluttered his wings. Misunderstanding. Confusion, maybe. Perhaps on a personal level? The signals were hard to interpret. It is Sajitsu, it announced. It paused for a moment, as though checking something out of shot, then shifted his attention back onto the screen. 0 0.93, it said. It cut the link. There was openly talk of new trade negotiations among the Sajitsu delegations, 
the deteriorating economic situation demanded it. An agreement would be reached and the humans would supply them with better priced minerals. Wealth and prosperity would be restored. You could hear their optimism, their anticipation. They sought technology exchanges and cultural programs, and other such nonsense too. Real proposals to the Terrans. Serious expectations that specifications about drives and power plants and environmental tolerances would be handed over. That children of each species would frolic in meadows together, singing sentimental songs of the other's homeworld. Madness! The human guards frowned in disgust and gripped their weapons tighter as the slender aliens nonchalantly ambled past in bead festooned groups, chattering and touching one another as they made their way to the Senate Hall. They even hailed and waved politely. They didn't seem to have a care in the world. The human representatives were furious. Every question, every plea for reason was airily swept aside, as though it was of no consequence. It is Sajitsu, said the speakers, for the other species wisely, as if that somehow explained it. They variously gestured expressions of sympathy for the humans. They didn't know either, that became painfully obvious. They'd all asked the Sajitsu, and they'd all got the same answer. It is Sajitsu. They were tense, though. Their physiologies all had giveaways, little nervous tics, and of late they were noticeably more cautious around the Sajitsu. They didn't understand this warlike behaviour any better than the humans did, and they were clearly glad the same wasn't happening to them. It was not something they had experienced before. None of the other species shared a word with the Sajitsu, though save of course for a few compounds that housed their diplomatic staff. None of them really shared their worlds at all, or had the human habit of emplacing themselves en masse on worlds already settled by others. It didn't mean that they didn't get along, that they weren't good neighbours, it was just that none of the other species had the compunction to integrate and coexist in the strange, impractical, gregariousness way the humans did. Except for the Sajitsu. It was ironic that they had been the most welcoming, the most accepting, the most open. Still cautious though, only willing to take baby steps, but there was far more than any of the others. They even counted in base 10, made everything so much simpler. They granted lands to the settlers from the jewel that was Morales, a whole continent, and a nice one at that, temperate and fertile. The world orbited a calm yellow star and had conditions ideal for both species. Though their settlements were separate on different land masses, they shared and traded comfortably with one another, and had done so now for generations. And Morales wasn't some backwater either. It was a vital link on the freight routes that wound down from the outer rim. A hub of trade, a hive of industry, with good yards and good facilities. A place both Sajitsu and Human were proud to call home. Only Morales though, so far. There had been talk of new human settlements further in, within the heart worlds. Negotiations had been quite advanced before the old Pastaru turned up his talon toes and went to meet his ancestors. That was then, though. Now the human senate officers were a maelstrom of activity, of calls and messages back and forth to try and discover what was happening. The settlement plans long since cast aside and forgotten. Experts peered at maps and dissected reports and tried to find answers. Humorless, somber-faced mandarins in sharp suits held hushed discussions with burly uniformed officers whose chests were thick with ribbons. Assistants and secretaries rushed here and there with data pads and documents and fresh cups of coffee. At least the conflict was restricted to Morales and showed no signs of spreading. Indeed, beyond that world, everything seemed to be as normal as it ever was within the Sajitsu polity. The economic difficulties it was experiencing muddied the waters, but there were no marked changes to industrial activities no unexplained movements of personnel or equipment, no indications of a greater military build-up. Things were happening, of course, the things that were not well understood. Some populations have been displaced, and new leaders and officials have been instated. But that was to be expected until the new Pastaru and his regime were firmly entrenched. Diplomatic efforts were stepped up and ships and agents were dispatched to gather as much intelligence as was possible. Long Beach and Carver were quiet sprawls, affluent suburbs of the city of Marshallan really, full of elegant high-rises, spacious malls and tidy hab units with carefully tended lawns and ocean views. The flat-bottomed landing craft deposited the heavy guns and their crews at intervals along the narrow windswept islands that lay off the main shore, then chugged off back to their tenders to collect their next load. 
The Sajitsu dug their artillery in, nearly stacked the ammunition canisters and stocks of supplies, and carefully confirmed their ranging. They waited. The officers watching their chronometers, and the troops checking over everything again and again. At the designated time, just as the yellow star dipped below the horizon, they let the barrage fly, great rippling volleys of fire that lit up the sky. Heavy shells, filled with high explosives or incendiary submunitions, rained down onto the quiet towns. As soon as the autoloaders were empty, new packs were hefted into place and firing resumed. The detonating shells lifted and flattened structures and tore great gouges into the ground, their blasts tracing methodical patterns across the grids of streets as they exploded. Gouts of earth and debris were thrown high into the air. Buildings shattered, apartment blocks and houses blew out or collapsed. People huddled and hid and cried, or ran here and there seeking shelter anywhere they could. The storm of fire was relentless, coldly efficient and brutal, cutting its victims down. The landing craft passed below the barrage and ground up onto the rocky mainland shore. Their forward ramps dropped, and vehicles, armoured, wheeled, towered to things, bristling with guns, roared up the shallow shingle beaches, over the scrubby, tough grass dunes, and onto the long coastal highway. They assembled, and at the arranged moment the artillery fire stopped and they swept off. They stalked through the town in loose, slow, growling groups, their articulated suspensions carrying them over the wreckage and craters, their guns mowing down anyone they saw and riddling houses and homes with rounds. The vehicles chose targets and let loose jets of chemical flame from their turrets, dowsing the shell-shattered ruins and turning them into infernos. The survivors fled the conflagrations and the Sajisu blast them down, driving over the injured as they chose a new spot to set aflame. Although the folks that lived there were as heavily armed as any, a rifle that would stop a car lash at 50 paces was little use against a tank. They tried, though, in little passes of resistance, lobbing bottles of burning volatiles that smashed against the armoured plates and sent sheets of flame over them, and even ramming one of the Sajisu invaders with a truck, spinning the tank around before it was able to back away and immolate and riddle its erstwhile attackers. They retreated back to their landing craft when their bloody work was done. The artillery spirited away too, and they withdrew to the fastness of the ocean, not trying to occupy the territory they had devastated. The grey-faced Terran intermediary demanded an audience. A Sajisu bureaucrat, in no hurry at all, eventually took the call. This is an atrocity, an outrage, said the human, fighting to keep his composure. We have no choice but to retaliate. It is Sajitsu. The bureaucrat faced Santana in a way that indicated annoyance or hunger. The gestures were similar. Why? said the intermediary. Why are you doing this? It seemed distracted for a moment, then briefly signalled understanding. 1.27, it replied. It cut the link. It had been decided. No weapons of mass destruction. No orbital bombardments. Equivalence. Retaliation. Escalate only if they did. Coordinated strikes. In force. That would negate the Sajusu capacity to attack. The planning was as meticulous as it was fast. The great poor cities of Ranatha and Surakal. Commercial centres and major hubs on the northern tip of the sprawling Southland were the prime targets. Exquisite reconnaissance, gleamed from satellite imagery and agents on the ground, and even from the myriad of tourism apps and image galleries that were available on the networks, provided a long list of targets. Analytical computers composited data, providing their output on hollow displays that pinpointed defensive positions and highlighted weak points. Coordinators and planners oversaw preparations and gathered supplies. Routes were plotted, and approvals were given and authorised by the highest officials. Contingencies were considered and accounted for. Units were made ready, and finally, zero hour came. It was lovely easy. Nothing to start with. Clear skies, like there wasn't a war on. The first weapons flashed in. Secretive Sajisu sites, control centers, and sensor farms were hit by hardened devices that piled themselves deep into the ground. Detonating with brutal force and erupting into enormous plumes of dirt and rock, tearing apart subterranean complexes and surface structures alike. Their defences were blinded, deafened. Their flag began, desultory and sporadic at first, 
but increasing in intensity until it seemed every one of the myriad spires and glows in the metropolises were throwing off sweeping arcs of yellow and white that lit up the skies. It was spectacular, but it was poorly placed at best, concentrated around the huge hives and sprawling warren mounds, far from the chosen targets. So the humans left them to their light show, if it kept them occupied. Waves of missile streaked in across the waters, unopposed, no counterfire of any kind. Each lined up their attack run and slammed into their targets in an inferno of destruction. Factories were leveled. Automated factories smashed. The ports were savaged. Dome sheds and long crescent halls were blasted away. Heavy organic looking cranes and cargo lifters severed from their mountings and thrown into mangled heaps. Dozens of the huge catamaran freighters left sinking or burning at their moorings of the harbours. The endless rows of storage compounds were cratered, with stacks of cargo pods smashed and scattered and their contents ablaze. Maglev routes across the region were cut and junctions broken, maintenance plants demolished, power grids torn apart, cargo relays flattened. Every strike, every blow precise, pinpoint accurate, Maximum damage, maximum effect, minimal casualties, surgical. They left the spaceport alone though, just as the Sajisu had left theirs. No need to set a precedent. The Sajisu Air Force rose to meet them, their stubby fighters rocketing up out of their silos. The massed human interceptors had been circling out over the waters, waiting for the moment. And they pounced. The fighters put up a damned hard fight, expertly weaving and spiralling, using every tactic they knew and every advantage they possessed. The human intelligence regarding their numbers and types had been more than good, and they were horribly outclassed and hideously outnumbered. It was hopeless. They never stood a chance. In a desperate spiral of manoeuvres and turns, they were torn to pieces by a blast of autocannon fire, exploding into greasy orange fireballs, or plunging downwards amidst flames and trails of dark smoke and debris, as one sneak interceptor after another got into a good position and let loose, eager to be the one to claim the kill. They were swept from the skies, their burning wreckage littered the ground. A special vengeance was reserved for the military bases and the naval facilities. Wave after wave of attacks went in, flattening launch silos and facilities and barracks and sheds. Anything that rolled or flew or floated was a prime target and the humans fired everything they had. When the missiles were done, the pilots disregarded orders and took their craft in, emptying their guns and pots into anything that was left, and even leaning out of their cockpit windows, blasting away with their pistols. For Long Beach, they yelled, and spat on the scorched and melted remains. Then they mined the naval facilities, specialist craft flying low over the shattered boats and landing craft in the harbours, and sewing the areas thickly with the devices. It was like training, like a simulator set on easy. The facilities, all of them, were rendered unusable. The humans had hit them hard. The Sajisu ambassador was furious, livid even. Why would you do this? Such barbarity, such terrible harm. The human representatives were speechless. Are we not your sisters, your brothers, your kin? It raged. Do we not live as one in togetherness? Do we not breathe the same air? Oh, how we have misjudged you, such cruelty. You have killed hundreds of thousands. Your actions are unacceptable. They belittle you, reduce you, they shame you. The ambassador stormed, spreading his jewel-woven wings and shouting over the voice of the human. Compensation is required, immediately and in full, so as to replace the losses you have wrought and to put right the wrong. It blinked his giant eyes, then seemed to gather itself. It folded his wings back in and lowered his head. It paused and breathed deeply. 1.27 it said. That is how it stands. It cut the link. It was being serious. 3.59 trillion credits in the form of material and components and strategic commodities to be provided to the Sajisu as compensation for the heinous acts, the war crimes that the humans had committed. Everything itemised, laid out in black and white, everything accounted for. The demand was presented to the Senate, nearly drafted, and in the correct languages and legally binding. To ignore it would be to undermine the whole foundation of Alliance law, no matter how pompous, no matter how hypocritical it might be. They had to hear it at least, even if the humans had no intention at all of agreeing to their demands. 
Day three, over 7,000 devices, proclaimed the cheer on. It was laid over shaky footage of the incoming rockets, or missiles, or whatever you wanted to call them, soaring overhead, the sky dark with them, it seemed. One, lower than the others, was clearly visible as it sped by, a bobber's nose cylinder festooned with curved wings and with a hot blue exhaust at the rear, twice the length of a man, and a pale grey colour that made it hard to see against the sky. The grim-faced anchor appeared with a map showing the whole northern seaboard and a swath of impact sites concentrated on and around the cities. The view cut to defence batteries, silhouetted against red evening clouds, angled upwards and firing sporadic bursts of bright white into the darkening skies. Every now and again, a yellow flash followed by a distant bang showed that they had found their targets. Then, cockpit camera views of craft sweeping down onto the launch sites. Of neatly lined up Sajisu launch vehicles, no attempt at concealment, fresh missiles stacked nearby. Their crews scattering as they became aware of the approaching threat. Munitions straddled them, and bright explosions engulfed them and tore them apart. The anchor paused her monologue while the footage played. Another map came up and she began again. Coastal regions have been evacuated following the Long Beach incident, and heavily equipped troops patrolled all the way from the impenetrable forests of the Sacrabar Peninsula to the white sands of the Abrogi, she explained. If another raid was tried, it would be met by considerable force. Images of equipment festooned soldiers scanning the horizon were followed by footage of those same soldiers taking optimistic pot shots at rockets that happened to be passing overhead. Advertising played, filled with frivolity, trite products being offered for sale. Then it cut back to the channel theme and logo, and then the anchor. Coming up, she said, we have expert analysis. Why do the missiles only explode over inhabited zones? Dramatic music surged and swirled in the background, and a graphic spun in the corner. The war. Where do we strike next? But first this. Scenes of scruffy but cheerful children appeared, sitting within a tiled tunnel and eagerly slurping at cups of broth. Casualties had been mercifully light. The voiceover from the anchor continued. The worst loss of life at Marsovano, where a family late to evacuation was caught in a blast. Footage showed people crowded together in stark grey chambers, sleeping in rows, or sitting in circles and praying and singing, kids playing on their consoles beside heavy blast doors, and toddlers clutching oversized plush toys or cooing happily on utilitarian bunks. Chirons gave the names of the towns as the images rolled. Almost the whole of the population were in shelters or public bunkers, a guest punted estimated, deep underground, where they were safe from the falling ordnance. Its annoyance was so palpable that the Sajisu ambassador almost smacked his white desktop. Still, you show such lack of foresight, such ignorance, he raged. Why would you do these things? The human intermediary stared back. It glanced away angrily, his eyes focusing back and forth. His antenna twitched in frustration. This cannot be, he exclaimed to some unseen being. It looked back to the screen. 1.27, it replied, hunching in a gesture of regret. Still, 1.27. It cut the link. Humans had a way of finding things out, of discovering, of uncovering the truth. Often, they wished that they didn't. Reports of the genocide, the clearances across the great settlements in the Southland, began to filter in. A public already hardened by the atrocities that they had suffered was shocked. Mass killings, hundreds of bombings, apparently, followed by execution squads that cut down survivors. It was unthinkable. The numbers were still provisional, but of the 30 million or so Sajitsu and Morales, the victims numbered far in excess of a million. So many. There were even reports of an appalling incident in Ranatha. The slaughter appeared to have stopped, relatively abruptly, around a week ago. Yet there seemed to be few repercussions within such as his society on Morales. No outrage, little acknowledgement even. The Sajitsu, keeping themselves to themselves as all these species did, said nothing. But they'd done it. They committed the deed, and they'd been found out. The investigators kept digging, and what began as a trickle of rumours and stories about the Southland turned into a flood. It wasn't just Morales. It was systems all across the Outer Rim. Appalling images of Sajitsu facilities on Lorcas emerged, of workers disposing of heaped corpses, 
the wounds on their broken bodies obvious to see. The census lists from Industrial Narvan were obtained, with endless designations, names in any other language struck through. Cold and impersonal. Another statistic, another number, to be disposed of. There were more. There was worse. It seemed to be random. Whole hives raised. And such as who cut down without regard for age or gender or belief or wing spread. Other hives untouched. Terror bombings that flattened whole districts. Armed squads with no declared allegiance and no markings, going systematically from level to level within the warrants and executing any they found, then just melting away. No factional group claimed responsibility. What monsters were they? The Sajisu representatives were confronted by the Senate, by humans and the other species too, appalled by what they had discovered. But they gave no explanation. They offered no apology. Every state pondered the new Pasdaru with anxiety and suspicion. His work, surely. A tyrant. A demagogue. A monster in the making. Ruthlessly cleansing his territories of all opposition. It would explain the disruption in their bureaucracy. The constant stream of new faces. No. Even a cursory look at the data showed that his allies, his trusted aides, his own clan even, had suffered as much as any. The massacres had hurt him equally. And not one individual from their worlds came forward to the Senate to ask for sanctuary or protection, though it would have been easy enough to do so. No appeals were lodged by grieving relatives. No complaints against the ass by the wronged. It was as though the dreadful crimes weren't happening, as if they didn't matter. It is Sajetsu, said their speaker, dispassionately. But, as it went on, and the awful reports continued to accumulate, they saw the hint of a pattern begin to emerge. It was easiest to spot on the rim, where the populations were low. The little mining outpost at Bonu, the intelligence proof showed, had 10,500 Sajisu staff and personnel, and independent reports all seemed to indicate around 450 deaths then no further trouble. The agricultural settlement at Cormax. 220,000 Sajitsu. Casualties believed to be approximately 9,000, then no further trouble. Ezra Mill, 38,000. Around 1,500 reported victims, then no further trouble. The ambassador stared out of the windows at the distant port facilities, and the silvery crescent of the moon still just visible in the sky. Merchantmen and freighters and liners and transports of all kinds were birth. Their hatches and doors open as crews struggled to organise the crowds that surged around them. A stream of shuttles ferried passengers up to yet more vessels in orbit, depositing their charges and then dropping back down for the next batch. Endless queues of evacuees clutching their most treasured possessions filed out from the terminal buildings onto the already full plascrete aprons. The majority were going to the big naval facility on Yana, for the time being. It had the facilities to cope. Chances are many of them would end up back on Morales, slipping back to their homes once this whole mess had been sorted out and things had calmed down. How to define it? The species, the state, an individual, a frame of mind? Yes, of course, but no. Necessity? An act of charity, or kindness even? Taking away the need to make an unpleasant decision? Doing something unpleasant so that someone else doesn't have to? Making a tough choice on someone else's behalf? Being humane? It's difficult. None are wrong. They all describe it in a way. None are quite right either. It's bigger. Terrible deeds done for the greater good. It's that too. And such things never sit well, no matter how we look at them. Uncomfortable echoes through history and all that. Murder us so that we wouldn't have to murder each other. Remote acts by unseen assailants, you'd never have to look them in the eye. Acts of misguided mercy, but leave all else intact, so that those who remain may prosper. For the greater good. The ambassador looked across to her intermediary. They say we grave integration, that we follow some instinctive drive to bond to be part of the group. She paused. Probably we do. The networks are full of fine stories about our pack bonding. They absolutely integrated us, you know. Took us in, made us a part of their own. Funny thing, though, we didn't notice. When they did what they felt they had to do, what well, they have always done when times are hard, they naturally included us in it. No need to warn, no need to explain. 
No exemption. Just do what was necessary. We are them. Well, on Morales at least. Why that number though? A scientifically derived benchmark? Ancient tradition? Some physiological or pheromoniatic trigger related to population density? No one was sure. Whatever the case, there were now resources to spare, and empty roles to be had throughout the Outer Rim, no matter the wrongs of it. Sociologists and economists and biologists and historians and the deities knew who else would be agonising and moralising over it for years to come. She shook her head and took her seat, initiating the communication. The image of her Sajisu counterpart appeared. Ambassador, she said, choosing her words carefully. 520,000 are gone. She closed her eyes and hung her head for a moment. The cull is done. The flock has been thinned, she continued. We offer our greatest thanks for your attempts to enact this difficult decision for us. To take from us the terrible burden of deciding who. But we have done what was necessary in our own way. The alien paused for a moment, looking beyond the camera and signalling with his antenna. 4.03, he replied, looking back and spreading his wings in an expression of satisfaction. And the humans willingly paid for reparations, more even than they asked for, and provided raw materials and finished goods and all the other things that were needed to repair the infrastructure that they had so efficiently demolished. They had it to spare. The factories of terror could churn it out faster than they could install it. It made sense. With a little goodwill, and by keeping a weather eye on their fragile economy, they could quietly step in where necessary, manipulate prices or availability. They could avoid anything like this ever happening again. But there was a better reason. A more noble reason. Plain and simple. That's what you do for your sister, your brother, your kin. That was Sajitsu.